I think that making sure that their employees and their technology are in line with their data privacy and data security expectations is is something that is sometimes coming to bite them. Uh, you know, especially as things open up, we're seeing some employees, oh, you know, I can go to Starbucks again. This is so great. And they're taking their laptop and, and uh, you know, working on something that is confidential or um, or proprietary or, you know, in, in an attorney's case, um, privileged. And, and those are, uh, those are serious problems and serious policy violations. You know, as an employer, you should have a policy against uh, releasing or, or disseminating confidential information. Good morning, HR. I'm Mike Coffey, and this is the podcast where I talk to business leaders about bringing people together to create value for shareholders, customers, and the community. Please follow, rate, and review Good Morning HR on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or at goodmorninghr.com. This week, we continue our review of the last two years of pandemic life. How has the workplace changed and what might it look for look like in the future? My guest today is Sarah Glasser, an employment law attorney with the firm Lloyd Goslink based in Austin, Texas. Over the last two years, she's helped employers navigate the legal issues surrounding COVID-19 from going remote to returning to the workplace. And she joins us today to discuss the pandemic's impact on employment law and employee relations. Welcome to Good Morning HR, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I think it's going to be a blast. I hope so. I'll ask you in 30 minutes if it was really worth it. (laughs) Um, Where were you two years ago when you realized that COVID-19 was going to be a thing, something that was really going to significantly impact our lives and our workplaces? Great question. Uh, I think I was like quite a few people at home uh, with my family and um, and my phone was ringing off the hook. It was uh, it was uh, you know if it wasn't if it wasn't the the five or ten clients that I talked to regularly, it was the five or ten that call me once a month. Or it, in fact, I probably talked to every single one of my clients in March, April, May because everybody needed help navigating this new situation. Um, I was also at home with my husband and my two kids, one of whom was an infant at the time. So it was, uh, life was just insane uh, then. And and it felt like it was never going to end. Yeah. Well, they told us, just do this for a few weeks. We'll flatten the curve and things will go back to normal. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't really the case. And, uh, you know, I think uh, to, to sort of expand on your question, I think um, one of, from a professional perspective, one of the, the points in time where I realized that this is nothing we have seen before was when Congress passed the FFCRA. Um, and we're not talking about that anymore because it's right. not, it doesn't even exist anymore. But, but that was like, whoa, we've been, trying, we've been talking about paid, paid family leave for a really long time and suddenly it happened. Yeah, those yeah, it was all the all the legislation there from mid-April through the end of June was just drinking from a fire hose for anybody in your in your seat or in an HR consulting role. Um, I do precious little real hands-on HR consulting anymore. I'm running my enterprise and my employees and all that. And I spent a lot more time doing just good old consulting stuff and helping employers figure stuff out. And I knew early on which of my employee employer clients we're going to weather it pretty well and which ones are going to have real changes just from the insight that I already had into how they ran their businesses. And, and that tended to, to work out. Uh, you know, I was just thinking I've got a, my, one of my best, two of my, my two closest friends on the planet besides my wife are both a lawyers. And uh, one of them is a plaintiff's lawyer and we work out together every morning uh, at 6 AM. And he's, he was he was taking this seriously in, in February, and we were we were at breakfast uh, one morning after workout, and he said, you know, and I was kind of being cavalier about this whole COVID thing. Yeah, they got some cases up in Washington. That's not that big of a deal. And he said, dude, this is going to be you know a big deal to the point that we may not be able to work out 
every morning. Go to yoga. We work with yoga. We, we, we practice yoga uh, at the same studio and work out together. And I'm like, we got to find a cure. I mean, that's it. I, you know, that's that's my line in the sand. You can do everything else, but you can't take that away. And they took that away from us for six months. I mean, it was just, you know, we, you know, a lot of it. Away. So, so it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's weird when you look back and I wouldn't want to go back to that whole shutdown period, but uh, it, it definitely made us stop and reevaluate how we do business uh, in a lot of ways. Um, how have you seen over the last two years, HR's role change? inside their businesses? I think it's changed in the sense that it has expanded. So we joke that HR plays this, this uh, multifaceted role where they're uh, you know, a quasi-legal expert, they're a medical expert, they, um, they're the counselor and the therapist. We joke about that, but I think that COVID amplified that. Suddenly, I mean, before COVID, when was the last time you looked at the CDC's website? Right. Right? Like never. Um, and and now HR professionals are expected to know what the CDC is saying right now when it has changed 20 times over the last two years. But we're expected they, – they are expected to be completely up to date on it as it is, as it's changing and as it's evolving. And that's just one aspect of it. Um, you know, you can expand the medical part of it to um, understanding how your office is supposed to be cleaned. What type of cleaners do we have to bring in to disinfect the office? What's the best, um, the best PPE for folks to wear, depending on uh, the situation? And, um, and, and all of these things are maybe things that HR might have touched one before all of this. And now all of a sudden, it's just you know, one part of 20 other things that they have to do in the day. And they're expected to be, be they're expected to be the expert on all of those things. And, and I've seen, especially in my small and medium sized clients that didn't necessarily have what you would call strategic HR. It was primarily transactional HR. Okay. You do new hire paperwork. You make sure your pay, payroll gets out on time. You do benefits enrollment, those kind of things. And suddenly their their executives are turning to them and saying, okay, so what are we going to do about this? Or what's our policy on remote work? Well, we don't have a policy on remote work because you've never allowed anybody to remote work. <laughs> you know, and so it's now, you know, and, and they were, you know, well, what's best practice? Uh, you know, and uh, all those kinds of things. I think you're right. HR had to step up and do a lot of things or and, you know, and I've certainly got small uh, employers, uh, you know, that and even private equity clients that are that have a number of employees but don't have an HR person. And and so the business owner had to step in and start making those those calls. Certainly, that's what I did. You know, I was on I was on spring break in Bentonville, Arkansas, and just started watching the country start shutting down and and got on the phone with my team and we went remote while I was on spring break. I mean, you know, and. I wrote my returning to the workplace book in June because it looked like we were all going back to work in June and and gave that to, you know, all our clients and everybody. And here we are two years later and I've got clients who, you know, who are like me who said, well, we're probably never going back to the, what we were. So, yeah. Well, um, maybe your book was manifesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it was I think we had an extra year and a half of COVID just because. Anytime I place a bet on something, it goes the other way. So my book on returning to work, work just made sure that that didn't happen. So next time I'll, I'll, I'll go long on COVID and maybe it'll help. There we go. But but you're right that HR suddenly has – not suddenly. They always have, but, but their role is expanded. They've got a bigger seat at the table now. Uh, you have a – you know as an HR professional, you have an opportunity to talk to the business owners about what the policy should be. Uh, you know, we, for example, remote work, um, you know, that's a big draw for a lot of people. So if we are having difficulties with respect to hiring, this is something we need to consider. Yeah. And, and I definitely want to spend some time on this whole remote work, telework and all that. But as you watch things unroll in, but way back in 2020, what did you see some employers do well? What were some things that you saw them, you know, they... They clearly knew, you know, they had a plan in place or they were able to react well in a, in a really positive way. Yeah. One of the things that I saw some of my clients do really well was move from being an in-person workplace to a remote workplace. There were 
some of my clients saw this coming. You know, we heard the news reports, we heard heard talk about China, and then as you said, Washington, uh, and and some of them started talking about what are we going to have to do? What are we going to do if we have to go home? And they started getting technology in place, and they started making plans for how we would operate or how they would operate as a remote workplace if we have to go. And so then when, because do you remember it was, it was very uh, quick to happen. I remember being in my office on, um, you know, March 13th and then thinking I'll pack an extra notebook in my bag just in case. And, and then we didn't come back for <laughs> a very long time. So so there were some of my clients were very prepared for that. They were they were ready for it and they had already started, you know, there were still bumps in the road, but they had already started setting up technology, particularly for the people who didn't necessarily have a laptop to take home. Uh, they a lot of our secretaries and paralegals in our firm uh, were working off of desktops. And so our firm was one of those one of those organizations that started planning in advance. And, um, and we were able to seamlessly, not seamlessly, very close to seamlessly go home and, and get everybody set up so that they could work. And I have, I have a number of clients um, and I know of a number of organizations and other firms in the area who, who it was not quite so seamless because they didn't plan ahead. So, so that's one of the things that I saw people do very well. Um, another one I think is, um, is, is, uh, the the character of management came out um, during during these difficult times. Uh, I I I don't want to put my clients into buckets, but I got to I, I was I, you know I talked to a lot of people about how they were going to implement things like FFCRA or how they were going to uh, address employees who think that they might have COVID. And remember, this was all the way back then when we didn't know how it was transmitted and we didn't exactly know what was um, what we needed to do in order to uh, flatten the curve or, you know, stop transmission, all that stuff. Um, you know, at one point in time, we thought touching things was how we got it. So, right. Yeah. People uh, were the, washing their fruit and stuff when they got yeah. it back from the groceries, right? Yeah. Watching the outside of your milk carton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But in, a, in any event, um, I saw two, two, uh, I guess, general attitudes. One, we're going to protect our employees, and and we're going to to treat them as we would like to be treated, uh, because because that's the right thing to do. But that translated back to their business because um, it it increased employee morale and made them feel like their organization was was there with them while all of this was going on. Um, and then on the other side, I saw, and you know. The reason for this could be any number of things, but but I saw employers who were not quite so caring about uh, about what was going on. We need you to be here. Um, you're interrupting our business. Uh, you know, oh, you're you're high risk. Well, you know, I I don't have work for you to do at home, so I'm sorry. Uh, and and so I, I saw employers treating treating their employees uh, two different ways. And um, and I, I feel that that one was was the way that ultimately probably resulted in employee retention and and more loyal employees, and the other one did not. So, a lack of compassion or understanding of the employees' specific circumstances, uh, and that's probably like you said, that's reflective of that management's character to start with in a lot of ways. Uh, one of our earliest guests on the podcast last year uh, was my friend, Terry Swain, who's an HR consultant. Uh, and uh, she, uh, and she, you know, we talked about how COVID exposed bad managers. And I said early on when we first started hitting the, uh, my clients who had good management, good people practices, uh, effective ways of managing performance versus just walking, managing by walking around, looking over your shoulder, you know, where those managers just had to keep their thumb on their employees in order to get things done. Those are going to be the ones that struggled when, when we went remote. And, and, and we've definitely seen it. I mean, that's, uh, you know, uh, how, how we manage people has got, has needed to change uh, just 
from a pure business efficiency point of view, but, uh, and, and uh, now it's a, an employee retention point of view and everything else. It's, it's got a giant impact. Um, what do you think the looking, you know, at where we are now, two years later and the changes, what do you think the biggest changes are in either employee mindsets or just attitude employers' attitudes about work? <laughs> Well, my my the first thing that comes to mind is telework. It's that's that that is the thing that came out of COVID that I think is here to stay. Um, but do you want to talk about that now? Sure, or? Yeah, let's jump on. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. I mean, I I think it's changed. It's changed employers' mindsets and it's changed employees' mindsets, and it's become an employee retention issue. And I think it is has already started to lead to a shift in the workplace. Um, everyone, every employer falls on a spectrum of, uh, you know, we are in person and you are not allowed to work from home to, uh, to we're fully remote. And everyone falls somewhere on that spectrum. And every employee falls somewhere on that spectrum as well. And I think what I'm seeing is that the employee and the employer don't necessarily line up. And there's going to be a shift of employees to employers that they do line up with. You know, to use to use my firm as an example, we are we are not a hundred percent. You have to be in the office every single day, but we are an in person workplace, and and we have lost some employees as a result of that because they did not want to be in the workplace. And and if that's the case, and that is our you know, our organization's position on that, then this isn't the right place for them to be. And they're going to find the right place for them to be. And then, and then we're going to hire someone who replaces them who is okay with being in person. And I think the same is true the other way with respect to remote work, because I am a, I, remote work was a special kind of torture for me. <laughs> and um, I, it, I could not wait to come back to the office and be around my people again. And I know that not everybody is like that, but that was that was my position. And so if if a firm who was 100% remote wanted to hire me, I think I would run away. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to end up with organizations that are full of introverts who work remote, who don't need a lot of sociability and don't need a lot of interaction with people and they're 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 great that way. And then organizations that have real estate and are full of extroverts, people who feed off that social energy and that inter- th- those kind of relationships. I think there's going to be more and more of that. And and I think, like you say, we all have different. I mean, I, I, my company is full of introverts, people who are doing background checks all day. They sit in front of two or three computer monitors all day long and do what is, you know, 80 percent of what they do is high level, detail oriented data entry. And then they have to jump up and for the other 20% and really solve problems that, that they're presented in the data. But, but even when we were all in the office, they would chat with each other uh, over, you know, and they, to the person sitting next to them at the next desk if they had a question rather than actually look somebody in the eyes and talk. And I was the biggest impediment to productivity because <laughs> I need people to talk to. I'd walk around and talk to people and do stuff and it would make them crazy. So they were all lo- they they love going remote, and so now I'm just constantly scheduling lunch and breakfast and everything else I can to get some interaction with people. So I think that's that's been a, a big one. But telework brings its own own issues, right? Uh, early on, you know, I talked to several clients who said who just said mentioned, oh yeah, we're remote, and you know, Susie moved to Colorado and John moved to you uh, know Oklahoma. And I'm like. Well, at what point have you looked at what point that makes you an employer in those states? Oh no, our office is still here in Texas or wherever. Uh, talk about that and what other issues uh, you know that remote work brings. Oh yeah, the ability to move around is creating an incredible amount of uh, of new questions for for employers and and it's folks who otherwise would never have thought about this um, because they're not multi-state employers have been talking about how state laws are different for a long time. But the smaller organizations that are based only in Texas that suddenly, like you said, have have folks go out to Oklahoma or, um, God forbid, California, oh, um, 
um, uh, they are they're, they've got to wrap their mind around the concept of being a multi-state employer and all of the things that come with it. Uh, you know, it, it's not to say you can't do it or you can't allow your employees to do it. It's just that you have to uh, evaluate whether. Well, okay, so my employee is working out of California. I guess, I'm going to use the nightmare scenario. Sure. <laughs> as California my, or New York City, one of those yeah, two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so so my, my employee is working out of California now. So uh, what state, what California laws might apply to them? And then, you know, California has, like San Francisco has got its own right. employment laws. And, and so if your employee, you have to look at exactly where your employee is because for most laws, the place where they are actually performing the work is what what law applies to them, um, except with respect to uh, the FMLA. So, so if you have an employee who is working in, say, San Francisco, all of San Francisco's laws apply to that person. Um, all of California's laws apply to that person. But if they are working out of a home base that is in Texas that's got 100 employees in it, that's where they're considered to be for purposes of FMLA. So, so there, there's this sort of like mesh of federal law, state law, and, and when you start sending people out or allowing people to go out into other states, you uh, double, triple, quadruple your compliance issues. So not to say you can't do it. It's just a lot more difficult. Well, and there's even taxation issues, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah, withholding in some states. And mm -hmm. like yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, all kinds of like little things like some states have a law that says you have to pay vacation out at termination or, um, you know, you have to pay the final paycheck at a different time upon termination, you know, within three days of termination or something like that. It's all these little tiny compliance things that that uh, it, it just you've got to go figure out what applies and how and when and to whom. Yeah, we've got. 2022 20, employees, something like that right now. And I've lost two good employees. One who's needed, had to relocate to Oklahoma uh, because of a spousal's relocation. And, and her first thought was, oh, I can do this remote. And said, I can't for one employee. I'm not willing to become a multi-state employer and, and file my corporate entity in, in Oklahoma and do all the things that I need to do to get set up. And another one uh, moving to San Diego, and I said, "Oh hell no!" <laughs> you know, it's just uh, there's if if there is you know when there's a an HRCI certification just for California employers, that tells you, you know, that's uh, that's more than I want to bite off, you know, for one employee. And so, uh, and of course, if, you know, I'm I'm talking to my friends in the PEO world, and you know, that's for some employers it's been a, 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 a great alternative. Okay. We go to PEO and they handle, you know, they've got the compliance and they handle all that. We don't have that internal uh, expertise in. Um, but no, but I'm lucky pew pew. I live in Texas and yeah. it's a, you know, big, we got a big state. I've told my employees they can live anywhere in Texas. As long as they understand within with 48 hours notice, they have to be up here in our, you know, in Fort Worth for a meeting. If we, you know, if we have an issue and we need to, you know, have a, a you know, whether it's an employee engagement thing or whatever, they've got to be here and, you know, and we'll give them a lot more in 48 hours. That's, that'd be a critical situation if it happened. But they got to be willing to come to Fort Worth to do that. But other than that, you can live in El Paso, which is my second favorite city in the country, or Austin, which is my third favorite, but for the traffic. Uh, but they can live anywhere as long as it's inside the state. So yeah, that's a, a wide perimeter you've given yeah. them. Yeah. But yeah. We do, that that brings up another interesting question that I'm getting pretty regularly, which is uh, travel expenses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you bring people in it, within a, within 48 hours notice, uh, you know, are they paying for it? Are you paying for it? Um, it's uh, it's it's a really it, it as I said, just expands the questions Um you know, what What about an employee who's working from home and is called in for a lunch meeting and mm -hmm. they just have to, you know, they, they just live over in West Austin. So it's a 20 minute drive. But do they have to clock out for that? Um, for the commute and, you know, part. OK, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what are you advising there? That's interesting. Uh, if yeah, if I need somebody to come into the office in the middle of the yeah. day um, and it's a it's a non-exempt employee. 
how, what, what's your advice on, and you know, uh, from, let's start with the legal advice. What's the legal responsibility versus just what maybe the, the common sense right thing to do is? <laughs> Actually, I think in this in this sense, I think they align with them with each other. Um, you know, I think that when an employee starts their work day, if if they've started at eight o'clock and they need to travel at you know eleven o'clock, I, I think you have to pay them for that because that's part of their work day. Um, so I also think that that's the common sense answer too. Um, so so in that case, they align with each other, but uh, but they don't always. <laughs> and let's take a quick break. If you're an HRCI or SHRM certified professional. This episode of Good Morning HR has been pre-approved for one half hour of recertification credit. To obtain the recertification information, visit goodmorninghr.com and click on Research Credits. Then select episode 38 and enter the keyword Glasser. That's G-L-A-S-E-R. Good Morning HR is brought to you by Imperative, premium background checks with fast and friendly service. 23 years ago, I founded Imperative to partner with risk-averse companies in making well-informed decisions about the people they involve in their business. We've identified the most common ways background check companies cut corners that impact the quality, accuracy, and depth of the information they provide employers. And their clients aren't even aware of these issues until something goes wrong. You can download the six questions you should ask of your background check vendor at imperativeinfo.com slash six. That's imperativeinfo.com slash S-I-X. And of course, you can always reach out to Imperative to discuss your background check process through our website at imperativeinfo.com. And now back to my conversation with Sarah Glasser. Well, so what about my employee in El Paso, who I don't have yet, but uh, I'd love to have an El Paso office. It gives me an excuse to go visit more. Um, and I tell them I need you to be in, in town, you know, next Tuesday for uh, a half day workshop that we're doing. Whose responsibility is that travel? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I think I think legally speaking, so long as they they know this up front it can be their responsibility because it particularly when we you have a workplace that was in person and then you went remote um, and you've got these employees who moved out to El Paso or moved out somewhere uh, with the understanding that they need to be back uh, you know I don't think that there's a law that requires you to pay that like as a business expense or something like that but in this might be a case where what the law says doesn't necessarily align with the employee retention common sense answer, which may be if you, you've got an employee who's a good employee that you want to keep um, out in El Paso and you need them in, um, you know, once a quarter, uh, you know, maybe the cost of you paying for that is is so minimal that it's worth it as an employee retention um, kind of benefit type thing. But so, you know, if you recruit somebody to work from home and then then say, well, yeah, but on your own dime, you've got to travel up here on these occasions, that, while it may be legal, does seem a little iffy, even just ethically from, from my point of view, and, and certainly from a, a employee satisfaction retention point of view, that's probably not your, not your best bet. But those are the kind of things employers don't think about until they're faced with that circumstance. And I think that's, uh, that, you know, you really need to get get management together and make these decisions before we encounter it. I mean, that's that's the, the, the more strategic part of HR that, rather than just putting out the fires. Yeah, absolutely. And really there needs to, I mean, this needs to be determined in advance at, amongst the management. There needs to be consensus amongst upper level management and then supervisors, lower level, frontline. Everybody needs to understand what the... Uh, the decision is what the policy is. It needs to be in writing. It needs to be in your handbook. Um, everyone who either supervisor, frontline, or employee, people who are actually complying with these rules, everyone should understand upfront what uh, what the expectations, what the boundaries are. Yeah, um, and then followed by all. This supervisor over here can't make exceptions uh, when the other supervisor down the hall is is carrying the company line for all their employees. That's it's, that's a recipe for disaster on the employee relations side, but also just as soon as you try to terminate somebody because they didn't come to a meeting or refuse to pay for it, 
uh, we're making exceptions left and right and you get problems. Um, what other things with the remote work, since that's, you know, that's what's really changed so much. What are other kind of concerns uh, our employers getting caught maybe by surprise with? Ooh, getting caught by surprise with? I think that making sure that their employees and their technology are in line with their data privacy and data security expectations is is something that is sometimes coming to bite them. Uh, you know, especially as things open up, we're seeing some employees, oh, you know, I can go to Starbucks again. This is so great. And they're taking their laptop and, and uh, you know, working on something that is confidential or, um, or proprietary or, you know, in, in an attorney's case, um, privileged. And, and those are, uh, those are serious problems and serious policy violations. Mm-hmm. You know, as an employer, you should have a policy against uh, releasing or, or disseminating confidential information. Um, or, I mean, even something as small as not having a designated workplace and your wife is across the, across the table from you, mm-hmm. you know, while you're talking on the phone about some uh, private financial information. So uh, confidentiality of information is, I think people are not thinking about it to the extent that they really should be. Um, and, um, and, and it's hopefully not, you know, coming back to bite them and it's just a risk at this point, but, but they, uh, you know, ensuring that employees and supervisors, again, understand what they have to do uh, in order to keep this type of information confidential and private uh, is is the best first step. Yeah, I've heard on a couple occasions conversations on cell phones at the bougie coffee shop that I hang out at uh, and just like in the next booth and is, in the, that my HR antenna go off and I hear what a manager is saying <laughs> to an employee and I'm like, okay, you're wrong there. You know, I want to go give them HR advice. I'm like, you know what? Uh, let me help you here. But then I'm like, okay, I don't know who that person is, but what if that was a customer or somebody who knows where this person works? You're you're just kind of putting the company's business out there for the whole world to hear. And I think that's a surprise. The other big concern is, is data security. And I've got Jody Daniels, who's a, a, a data and privacy expert and has a great podcast on it coming on in, in a few weeks. But, uh, People with just, you know, issue, we're just going to issue a laptop and yeah, have all the company data on there and, uh, and then take it around, you know, everywhere, where you go. And, you know, I, I flew a couple of times this, in, uh, over this past weekend. And how many times do you hear the announcements with the person who left a Dell laptop at security station three, please come. And, you know, let's just need somebody, you know, anybody go pick that up and, and walk away with it and, depending on how good your encryption and your technology is, the keys to the kingdom can be right there on that laptop. And before you, you know, you're, you know, before you're, you even realize it's gone or you've lost it, uh, you know, there, there could be a lot of compromise there. Yeah, exactly. That's a, a huge one. Um, and, but again, just, just like with, uh, with, with travel expenses and just like with everything connected to remote work, it's, it's a matter of, creating a policy and making sure that it is uh, disseminated and and that folks understand what the rules are and and you can you can control for these risks you just have to think about them in advance um, another big one that we haven't talked about are wage and hour issues because we're always on call right I got, I can, <laughs> my office is right here next to next to my dining on my dining room table so I can always just pop in and do some email so what are the big issues there? Yeah, well, um, you know, I I would expect that you're probably an exempt employee, and so you are allowed to log on um, at eleven thirty at night if you want to. Um, and but but there are lots of employees who who are not they're they're non exempt and they're paid hourly, and it's really important for employers to make sure that they pay them for all of their time that's worked. And you know, I think we saw this. I think employers caught on to this and realized the importance of it. As folks were going home, I have had some. I have had some issues with some of my clients where where um, we're getting overtime claims uh, from from way back in 2020, or you know, over the summer stuff like that. And our answer is kind of, we didn't have enough work to do back then. <laughs> you you were bored. You weren't working overtime, but but the answer was no. I mean, I was I was on my computer 
from eight in the morning until nine at night and I was doing this and you know how do you know differently do you have the electronic records for that so so it's getting a little bit messy um, but but you know reversing out the 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 issue for employers is making sure that their non-exempt employees understand what this what their schedule is um, that they have to clock in, they have to clock out. If they want to work overtime, they have to request permission um, and get approval if that's what your policy is. Uh, and and that they have to record all of the hours that they work so that they can get paid for all of the hours that they work. Uh, and, um, and, you know, again, making sure you have a policy that says all those things is a, a long way towards uh, being in compliance with that. Yeah, I just uh, went that long ago that I, I talked to an employer who said basically – my employees, if they don't record their time and report it to me, that's on them, not on me, because I've got a system set. And, I, and I'm like, well, FLSA requires the employer to keep track of the time. I mean, that's the employer's responsibility. And so if an employee comes back and says, I forgot to tell you about this, that's on you as much as them. And and, and I think the days of, of just keeping an Excel spreadsheet out there on a server someplace where people are are supposed to put in their time back and forth in a remote environment like this, you, it's probably time to do something a little bit better. Plus, you know, the, the investigator and cynic in me, you know, employees will pad their time. Uh, you know, that's, we've all seen it. And, and, um, and so having, you know, it, you know, having a system where they have to be, their computer has to be hard connected to your network in order for them to really be able to do any work. And for a lot of your non your non exempt employees, that's probably true. I mean, you got to be connected to servers or networks, and and there's a good check and balance right there. And we know you can't do any work on behalf of the company if you're not connected to the network if it's that kind of environment. And and then so let's look at your connection times and let's check mm -hmm. you know and balance that. Yeah, well, and that's the other side of the issue, the productivity and monitoring that. And there has been a lot of talk about micromanaging and how closely should you watch your employees. But I want to say one thing about your comment earlier about, about your your friend or uh, client who um, who feels like, um, you know, he's going to take his employees' uh, records as as their word. And, and I think as an employer, you, so long as you have a policy that says, you know, you employee are obligated to record your time accurately. You get to do that to an extent. If your employee is doing something that you, sh you as a rational, common sense person, should be questioning what they're doing. If they're if they're saying that they're clocking off at six o'clock, but you're getting emails at midnight, you have an obligation to ask questions about that. You can't just say. Well, they only wrote down nine to six, so that's what they get paid for. You have to do some investigation when you see, um, or you know, if they're sending you messages, or they're doing an incredible amount of work that you, you, they, no one could possibly do this in a work day. Um, that's something you have to look into. You can't just, you know, bury your head in the sand. Yeah, and those and your superstar employees, off, you know, on the non-exempt side, are often really dedicated, and will say. Oh, I don't mind. You don't have to charge me for that. You know, you, I, I'm not going to charge you for this. I just want to. It's not a matter. You know, you're not a 1099 contract. You're not a. You're not. A, you know, you're not a contract. You know, you're not a vendor right, who's going to throw in some extra labor. But you know, you're an empl employee, and and I need to pay you for you know every minute of it. And you know, there's not much because if you're sending emails and reading emails, that's probably not going to qualify at this point as de minimis. Uh, I would think. Uh, you know. You know, it's one thing to scan your emails and say, oh, I don't have anything to worry about tomorrow. But I always think I'm just going to scan my emails. I pull up my phone and just stuff. And then 15 minutes later, I've realized, uh, oh, I don't I haven't heard. You know, I last I just missed 15 minutes of Yellowstone because I was just going to peek at my uh, at my uh, email. So uh, Beth Dutton for president, by the way. Um, I've, I've heard great things about Yellowstone. Yeah, yes. It's on the list. One uh, last thing, because we're running out of time, and you talk to a lot of employers. What do you think that, looking into your crystal ball, what's the one big issue that you think employers should be considering about, you know, planning for in the future, like we weren't, you know, some of us did and didn't plan for COVID? What do you think the thing that employers is on the horizon that employers haven't prepared for yet? This is adjacent to the telework issue. Uh, I, I think that 
if you are an employer and you have not decided what you're going to do about remote work, um, got a plan in place, I think that you are putting yourself at a disadvantage in the, in the market with respect to hiring employees. And I think that the um, – this is getting outside of my legal mm-hmm. – no, um, my legal good. prowess – uh, and more into just what I think generally about about creative workplaces and um, and remote work is one of those elements of creative workplaces. But I think that the work what we what we see as a traditional workplace where you come into an office like like this, um, like where I'm sitting or um, or what I do every day, is is not going to disappear for everyone, but is forever changed for a lot of people and a lot of organizations and. Um, and I think that employers who don't recognize that as a um, a method of attracting good, uh, qualified, diverse applicants to fill their positions are really doing themselves a disservice. So, I you know I touch on benefits and I write policies with respect to benefits, um, and I'm writing some creative policies these days. But uh, but but. I, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily inside of my my legal scope, uh, but but I do see that as the future. And employees' expectations. I, you know, I think like we talked about earlier, there are a lot of employees who've said, "I would rather go find another role, even though I like the company." I, you know, I've I found I'm, you know, at least in the employee's opinion, they're more productive, uh, and they certainly like working from home in their slippers um, more than they do, you know, going into an office. Uh, any other any other feedback you've you've had from your clients about how employees' expectations are changing? Just in general, we keep hearing about the Great Resignation and all of that, but uh, you know, and I'm hearing all the time about how uh, you know somebody will come on board and leave after three days, or just not show up after lunch, and things like that from from clients. And so, what do you what's your sense for how ex- ex- employees' expectations are changing? Well, I definitely think it's an employee's market right now, and they know it. They, they. Um, I saw a funny meme the other day. Am I allowed to talk about memes on a podcast? Oh, yeah, I yeah. don't know because how do I describe it? But but they were comparing and contrasting um, um, law grads ten years ago to to the graduates who are. If you don't know this, there is a. Um, a, a competitive market right now in terms for for these big law firms where they keep raising the starting salary to like exorbitant amounts, and there are so many there are so many new graduates, new employees. You can expand this out into outside of law grads into the the rest of the world. There are so many good qualified employees out there um, who have very high expectations of what types of benefits are going to be afforded to them, um, what types of flexible workplaces they're going to have. I think flexibility in terms of um, where we work, when we work, how we work, all of those things are, are going to expand as employees realize I think I can do my job just as well as I was doing before. Um, and they might be right. They might not be right. It depends on the workplace, I think. Um, but but nonetheless, they feel that way. And and we need employees right now. So, uh, so employers who don't pay attention to that and don't look at what their applicants are asking for are, um, are putting themselves behind those employees who are doing so. Yeah, for 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 and in defining things like so it's black and white and everybody knows what it looks like when you use terms like flexibility. Um, it's um, I was just talking to an employer who had an employee relations issue and hired somebody during COVID, and uh, you know during COVID, you know you know we offer you know they weren't all the marketing wasn't during COVID we're letting you work from home. It was remote work available. Very flexible workplace, but now when they're trying to uh, uh, reel everybody in, I mean, they, they're manufacturing employees, and all those folks had to be here a whole time, and so they feel like, yeah, we need to make the office people start to come back to work because it's kind of a double standard. But people that they've hired over COVID are like, look at the the job ad I responded to. It says remote work available, or you know, and so at least I need hybrid, and and, and you, you know, you got to. And if you're going to do something and it's, and you know, everything should be subject to 
whatever our you know current conditions are and, and everything's subject to change. But do you really want to spend six months onboarding, training, and getting somebody up to full speed only to lose them because circumstances changed and they didn't under, they didn't expect that things were going to ever change, that they were always going to have the, the flexibility or the, whatever the benefit is that you're that you're giving them. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, well, I feel for that employee because they sounds like they found themselves in a position that that they didn't know they were going to find themselves in, uh, and and that's a, a communications issue. Sure, and and we just need to be open and honest with everybody about okay. And I think that's one thing that a lot of employers I've seen do things well. They've been just real transparent. Okay, this is what we know now. As the situation change, we'll keep you posted, and and you know. We'll communicate rather than just all out of the blue one day saying, oh, yeah, everybody's coming back to work next Monday and nobody's thought about it, prepared for it. And it's it's uh, it's it's a shock to the employees. Yeah. Well, to bring this full circle, I mean, you remember back in um, in May of 2020 or, or, you know, around that time, nobody knew anything. We didn't we didn't know what was how we caught this or um, or how it was transmitted or how long we were going to be home or um, whether masks work or not uh, anything and and we were all just doing our best and I think that the folks who who did the best communicating were the ones that said we acknowledge we don't know everything we acknowledge that this is temporary policy this is what we're doing now because this is what the current science says and um, those were the folks that gained the most credibility with their employees or with the people who are listening to them. Um, and they're the ones who, who didn't lose trust when they had to change their policy or when um, you know they no longer could offer paid sick leave or something like that. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you for joining me, Sarah. Hey, it was a pleasure. I loved it. Thanks, Thanks. for having me. And thank you for listening. You can find previous episodes, show notes, and contact info for our guests at goodmorninghr.com or on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. And don't forget to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Rob Upchurch is our technical producer, and I'm Mike Coffey. As always, don't hesitate to reach out if I can be of service to you personally or professionally. I'll see you next week, and until then, be well, do good, keep your chin up.